everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I think we're gonna actually, we're gonna start with a reading and then we're, we'll go into discussion. So Anna will be first. Awesome, thanks so much. Thank you, Reese. Thank you so much, um, Serena, Books Are Magic. Thank you all of you for coming. This is so nice. Um, you know, I know that people are on a lot of Zooms a lot of the time, and so it's really so sweet and moving for you to come and see us. Um, and I super miss bookstores a lot, but it's really nice to Zoom into one tonight. So, um, so thanks so much to everybody. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read a tiny bit and then we can go into discussion. Um, this is Outlawed. Um, I'm just going to read from the very beginning so you don't need to know anything. Um, okay, chapter one. In the year of our Lord, 1894, I became an outlaw. Like a lot of things, it didn't happen all at once. First, I had to get married. I felt lucky on the day of my wedding dance. At 17, I wasn't the first girl in my class to marry, but I was one of them and my husband was a handsome boy from a good family. He had three siblings like me and his mama was one of seven. Did I love him? We used to say we loved our beaus, my girlfriends and I. I remember spending hours talking about his broad shoulders, his awkward but charming dancing, the bashful way he always said my name. The first few months of my marriage were sweet ones. My husband and I were hungry for each other all the time. In ninth form, when the girls and boys were separated to prepare us for married life, Mrs. Spencer had explained to us that it would be our duty to lie with our husbands regularly so that we could have children for baby Jesus. We already knew about the children part. We had read Burton's Lessons of the Infant Jesus Christ every year since third form, so we had heard about how God sent the great flu to cleanse the world of evil, just like he'd sent the flood so many centuries before. We knew that baby Jesus had appeared to Mary of Texarkana after the sickness had killed nine of every ten men, women, and children from Boston to California and struck a covenant with her. If those who remained were fruitful and peopled the world in his image, he would spare them for their sickness, and they and their descendants forever after would be precious to him. But in ninth form, we learned about lying with our husbands, how we should wash beforehand and put perfume behind our ears, how we should breathe slowly to relax our muscles and try to look our husbands in the eyes, how we'd bleed. Don't worry, Mrs. Spencer said then, smiling at us. It only hurts in the beginning. After a while, you'll start to like it. There's nothing more joyful than two people joining together to make a child. My husband did not know what to do at first, but he took his responsibility seriously and what he lacked in experience he made up for in ardor. We lived with his parents while he saved for a house. In the mornings, his mother made little jokes about how soon I'd be eating for two. During the day, I still attended births with my mama. I was the eldest and the only one who actually wanted to learn about breech births and morning sickness and childbed fever. So I was the one who would take over for mama when she got too old. When I came on rounds with my new wedding ring, the mothers to be winked and teased me. It's good you're learning about all this now, said Alma Bunting, 40 years old, pregnant with her sixth child and suffering from hemorrhoids. Then you won't be surprised when it's your turn. I just laughed. I was not like my friend Ula who had eight baby names picked out, four boys and four girls. When I was 10 and my sister was two months old, my mama had gone to bed and stayed there for a year. So I had already been a mama. I had changed a baby, fed her from a bottle when mama couldn't nurse, soothed her at night when I was still young enough to be afraid of the dark. I was not in a rush to do it again. I knew from working with mama that sometimes it could take months, even for a young girl like me. And I was happy to sleep with my new husband and still sneak off sometimes to drink Juneberry wine behind the Peterson's barn with Ula and Susie and Mary Alice and not have to worry about anyone except for me. I'll stop there and we can chat a little bit. Thank you for that reading, Anna. Um, it's so fun to hear you read it. So, uh, <laughs> thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say one word about um, clearly, as you can tell from what Anna read. Um, this is a tremendous book. It was such a joyful read for me. I highly encourage you, if you haven't bought it yet, to buy it. I also highly encourage you um, to buy it from Books Are Magic. Um, if you value these kinds of events, if you if you want bookstores to survive, and I really do, um, then buying from the buying books from the events at which the books are featured are, is, is really meaningful. And it means a lot to bookstores as these events like are resource heavy and there's time and, and so on. Um, so yeah, buy the book because it's wonderful. Um, first of all, if you can buy it from Books Are Magic, um, then that would be also very wonderful. Um, so I, I love this book so much. Um, it, uh, I wonder if for people who haven't read the book yet, can you tell us um, what you tell people about the novel? Like what you tell people it's about? 
Sure. So first of all, super cosign purchasing from Books or Magic support indie booksellers. They're just doing such incredible hard work right now. It's a really hard time for indies, but they're also just like doing this incredible work to keep the literary community together. So just like huge, huge thanks and support them if you're able. Um, but yeah, what do I tell people? Um, I tell people that one way to think about it is as a feminist Western or a revisionist Western. Um, and it's about a young woman, Ada, who um, is apprenticed to a midwife. Um, and she, uh, she marries, um, she's in a society that's very obsessed with reproduction. And then she finds that she can't have children. So she's forced on the run. Um, and then the book is also an alternate history. So it's an alternate history of the Hole in the Wall gang, who were a real gang of outlaws, and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, who are also real. Um, this is a retelling of that story that isn't real. Um, and in this story, Ada um, seeks out this mysterious hole in the wall gang led by a mercurial figure known as the Kid. Um, and Ada has to decide sort of whether she's going to sign up with the gang and whether she's going to sign on to, you know, this potentially very dangerous plan, um, you know, that could put her at risk, but could also, um, you know, sort of create a new space for people who have been outcast in this world. Amazing. Um... I wonder if, can you talk about, you've, you've said that it was important to you that the alternate history world of your book not actually exist in the real world. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about that. What drew you to this thought of like an alternate history of the American West? Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, I've written, now this is my third novel and I've written, my first novel is set not in our world. And then my second novel is set in our world. It's a realist novel about a film director. And then this is another book that I chose to set not in our world. Um, and, you know, I think I wanted, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, to start, I wanted to play with the genre of the Western. And I think in order to do that in a way that I wanted to do it, I had to kind of free myself from what really happened. Um, and at the same time, too, I wanted to explore the idea of sort of the choices that people make and the lives that they live when they're in really difficult circumstances. Um, and that is something that is often explored through dystopia. Um, but I didn't want to write another dystopia in part because it feels like we're living in dystopia and it felt that way when I started this book. Um, and it still feels that way now when it's finished, um, maybe even more so. Um, and so an alternate history was this way of kind of like forming a laboratory for people's lives, forming a laboratory for different types of choices and different types of narratives and different types of you know social structures to emerge, but without saying like this is after the end of the world. Um, you know, I was like spending a lot of time, like folks in the writing group will remember, like I spent a lot of time writing about like these farmers, like in these sort of like quasi post-apocalyptic agrarian societies. And I really wanted to look at like, what does like a post-capitalism look like? You know, what does a post-America look like? Um, this book incidentally is also set in a post-America because the United States has ceased to exist, but it's like kind of, it's like kind of also pre-capitalist and like pre-America or just like a different, a different timeline. I just wanted to be in this different timeline and so that, so that we could have this kind of, this kind of laboratory sense or this sense of play rather than a sense of trying to be faithful to the true history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder what's it been like for, um, I was thinking, I was, I was rereading the book and I was thinking about the first, last time I read it was, um, it must've been like, I don't know, a full year ago maybe. Um, and I was just like, the world has changed a little bit since then. <laughs> what's it like, I don't know, I guess I wonder what's it like having a book like this come out um, almost a year into this pandemic. Um, and it came out like the week of, no, the day of the Georgia elections. Um, yeah. the, <laughs> Day before and, the coup, yep. <laughs> yep, just a day, oh, one quick day before the coup attempt. Yeah, um, yeah so so how's how, how's that? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, let's go back in time for a minute. So um, when um, I think I was finishing copy edits when we started to have a shutdown here in New York, um, you know, so like in March. 
we could tell, you know, we could start to tell things are getting very bad. And I remember that Bloomsbury, which hi, if anybody um, is on the call, I want to say like he, such huge thanks to everyone who has been, you know, supporting me throughout like a, what's a really difficult time for publishers also like everyone's having a difficult time and everyone is is doing really amazing. So thank you. Um, but but yeah, I think my publisher had sent me, you know, like page proofs, like, you know, a stack, like a manuscript, like like whole printed out stack of the book um, to mark up, um, you know, with, with copy editor's notes. Um, and I remember it was like probably like, you know, March 8th or something. I went to like my favorite local coffee shop where I would like try to go to like get some quiet. Um, I'm like marking up pages, but like beforehand, I like bleach wiped down the table and I like brought like hand sanitizer and everything. And like everyone in the whole coffee shop was just only talking about coronavirus. Um, and I remember thinking like, I wonder if this is like the last time I'm going to be in this coffee shop for a really long time. And it was. Um, and after that, like I still had the manuscript, but I remember emailing Bloomsbury and saying like, can I like, I, this is going to need to be a word file. Like, I'm not sure about like getting this like to a FedEx location like at that time I was like like are you going to even want something that I've like touched and breathed on you know like we didn't know that much about surfaces I was like I don't want to give you something from my house like we were all coughing like this was March you know um and yeah so it definitely um the every like everything in the story sort of took on a different like tone I mean, it was mostly done you know the copy edits were just like were very essential but it's not necessarily like changing big parts of the story but the way i thought about it did change to a degree especially um you know this is a book that's set in the wake of a pandemic so the like in in the book like the world of the book and our world diverge in 1830 um and in 1830 there was a flu pandemic in the world um, and, you know, I had researched, I looked back at like all the, you know, this was four or five years ago, I had looked back at like all the flu pandemics and chosen the one that I decided would be the inflection point where this history diverges. Um, so in this book, the 1830 pandemic is just much, much worse and destroys the United States. Um, and, you know, that was an important part of the book when I was writing it, but it wasn't the most important and it's still not the most important um but it's certainly a part of the book that i think about a lot more um and especially now like in my journalism job a lot of my journalism is focused on um you know the inequalities that existed before the pandemic and have been sort of laid bare by it and what can be done during and afterwards to remedy those and I think about that in the context of the book too, because it's this is very much a post-pandemic world where people have chosen one way to live that, um, you know, is very dangerous for a lot of people, and you know, for Ada and for people like her is deeply marginalizing. And then there's a group of people that have chosen a different way to live. Um, so in some ways, it feels like. The, some in some ways the wor world of the hole in the wall gang can feel like this nice place in some ways it's like oh, okay look like these are people that have chosen kind of a hopeful way to live in the midst of a devastation um and in some ways that can feel nice now that we're kind of still in the middle of a devastation if that if that makes sense yeah absolutely i think um i've been recommending this to so many people as like a as a really good read for, I mean, for any time, but I feel as though it's it's a really good read for now. Um, it's it's also really fun. I feel as though I haven't seen the reviews really emphasize how how incredibly fun the book is. Like it's just, it's fun and it's moving and it's powerful and it's like so many all the good things you want in a book. Um, Thank you. Can can you talk about that reporting work? Um, I know you often cover reproductive justice um, issues and how it might have intersected with this book and with your fiction in general? Yeah, this is definitely the book. I feel like for years I was sort of like, these are very separate spheres, you know, like maybe like, maybe they pollinate each other a little bit, but I try to keep them really separate. Um, I used to try to like do my fiction work in a different physical space and my journalism work. Now, obviously I do everything in the same very small physical space, um, you know, but, um, but for this book, more so than any of the others, I think, um, you know, there's been, a, you know, a lot of cross influence. Um, and I think especially, um, you know, with um, with the issue of midwifery. So um, Ada's mother is a midwife. And Ada is learning to be a midwife and like ends up using a lot of those skills throughout the book. And that's something that I got really interested in before I was working on the book and then during and I'm actually like even more interested now and have been working on even more in my reporting. Um, 
just because I've been learning the ways that midwives were sort of forced out of the delivery room and really forced out of, you know, medical practice almost entirely um, by male doctors over the course of the 19th century and the ways that that marginalized black practitioners in particular, but marginalized female practitioners of all races, um, you know, and then meant like that worst outcomes for birthing people. So, um, you know, now we see it's like very, very small percentage of births in the US are attended by midwives. Um, in the UK, it's much higher. In the UK, they have much better outcomes. And, um, you know, so I didn't know, I think, you know, five, six years ago, I didn't know that much about the history of birth in the US or just the history of reproductive care because midwives would do far and away, not just birth, you know, they would do abortions, um, they would do counseling around birth control, um, and they would do abortions back in the colonial period when they were much less regulated. Um, and not particularly stigmatized in a lot of places. And they would give just like average medical care, you know, like there's this wonderful, God, I want to say it's just called a midwife's tale, but I keep getting this wrong. I need to just like buy a physical copy. I have it on my Kindle. I need to have like a physical copy here with me so I can reference it. Um, but it's the diary of a midwife in Maine. And it just talks about like what she did in over the course of five years. And it'll make you feel so lazy because she's like, today I like forded a river with my horse and then I delivered like eight babies. And then I visited someone with the flu and then I sold eight bolts of cloth and then and I testified in court and you know it's just like she's like incredibly prolific and like clearly like a central figure in her town and treating like all manner of ailments and social issues and doing business um so I don't know that's a long answer but I think um just something I've been really interested in over the course of this book and now remain really interested in is like who is able to practice reproductive health care and mm -hmm. how does that impact the kind of care that people get and who's able to access care. I think that's something that's like even now even becoming more important as we see a pandemic that's limited people's access to care even more. So I'm just like excited to talk to more midwives in the future. Yeah, and I was thinking um, while reading this book that now I have like more friends who are planning to or are actually in the middle of learning how to give abortions um, because of the great fear that um, even more will be taken from us and has been taken. Um, yeah, I, uh, with, the, with what you're saying about, I wonder if you could talk about the, um, part of what I love about this book is, is the attention um, paid to bodies, um, both of course in terms of what it is looking for, which is um, to know more about women's bodies and how they work, um, as well as in the care the book has for bodies in the aftermath of violence. Um, I feel as though, especially in Westerns, that's not something I've seen very much of. It's like people like fall and they just kind of bounce um, as far as I can tell. And, <laughs> and so I, I feel as especially when I'm teaching, teaching writing, it's a central question that often comes up. Like, what are these bodies up to? Um, do your characters have bodies? Like, what are they doing? And so now, now I feel as I have another book I can point people toward, like a book that's highly conscious of bodies and like a highly, like highly embodied. Like, can you talk more about the role or importance of, 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 of physicality in this book? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it was really important to me to, um, you know, kind of talk about the way the bodies are cared for in this book. I'm thinking especially of Lark and when he talks about um, the care that he was shown for his body and his injuries. Um, it's a character that Ada meets later on in the book. Um, you know, and he also talks about working with a veterinarian and how the veterinarian cares for the bodies of animals and like treats them like with real respect and love. And so, um, you know, so just, um, you know, just the ideas that, just the idea that people's bodies are worthy of care, I think is something that I, mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, kind of emphasize in the way that injuries are described. And I also just like kind of wanted to be like unflinching in the way that injuries are described, but not in a way of um, like being like graphic or like trying to like hit you in the face with it, but more in a way of this is just like kind of how life is. And I'm not talking exclusively about like gunfights, but like, I don't know, like I was finishing this book, like right after I gave birth. So I, um, you know, I was, I was working on it and then I got pregnant and I was like, oh, I better finish it really quick. Um, I better finish it, I better finish it. And I was like really close to being done. And then my son was one week early, which is like not early medically, but early in, in terms of like us not being done with any of our stuff. Um, and so I did a lot of, a lot of the final chapters um, 
you know, while he was really tiny and while I was still healing. Um, and I remember right before I gave birth, someone like um, a woman who I worked with who had just given birth herself was like, I needed like 17 stitches and it hurt a lot. And I wish someone had told me that I, that might happen. Mm -hmm. And I'm somewhat like, I always like usually don't enjoy warnings like that. Cause like I'm an anxious person and like that usually just like stresses me out. But then I needed a lot of stitches and it really hurt and it took a long time to heal. And I was really grateful that someone had told me that. Cause mm -hmm. otherwise I feel like, especially in that scenario, like you're just kind of taught to feel like you screwed up. You didn't do a good job giving birth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think like throughout, I just wanted to kind of, um, in addition to sort of showing a variety of bodies as worthy of care, I wanted to be like being a human, like involves a lot of blood and like gross stuff. And like, this is part of the, the rich tapestry, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's something I'm like permanently hungry for. Anytime there's a like a birth story that that someone's published, like I lunge at those. I love hearing. I don't have kids. Um, I don't even want kids, but it's a story. I feel as I just don't. I know so little about how we're born and how how like wombs work. Um, and I'm just like, why do I know so little about this? When I know, I feel as I know so much about like trench warfare in World War One. And <laughs> <laughs> This is an imbalance. It's a historical balance and it pisses me off. <laughs> and the crazy thing is like, I didn't know that much about it, even though like this is an area that I worked on for years before I had a baby, but there's like a ton of stuff I didn't know until I had a baby because they taught me in like the class that you take. And then the mm -hmm. class that you take is like pretty expensive and like covered by insurance. Like even with my insurance, I feel like it was like 300 bucks. So then I'm like, mm -hmm. definitely not everyone is taking this class. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, there's just so much, like, there's so much that you don't, that you don't learn. I remember um, a friend of mine, um, if he's on the call, he'll know who he is. Um, it, I was like eight and a half months pregnant. And he asked me, he was like, um, he was like, did they train you to give birth on your own in the wilderness in case of a disaster? Um, and I was like, wow, no, definitely, certainly not. Nope, nope. Um, and then I like didn't think about that again until there was a pandemic. And then I was like, oh, maybe they should have taught me that. Um, you know, but like, that's just like a small, like, that's an extreme example. But like, there's just like so many things about having a human body, and especially like having a birthing body, like, you know, we just don't, there's just so much that's not talked about and that we don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can you, um, maybe this is a good segue to talking about community. Um, I, was, I was realizing that, so you and I are in um, two branches of, um, of a writing group that you've been in since college. Um, and I joined sometime after grad school and I've never overlapped with you, but I've like, that was how I knew of you first is Anna North who's in the writing group and it's cool. Um, <laughs> And then, um, and then, yeah, it's been a joy to get to know you over the past few years. Um, and I wonder if you can talk about the role of um, this writing group in your writing life um, and maybe other, any other communities as well. Yeah, I mean, this is something that's really like warmed my heart a lot, like especially in the last year when like we've been isolated, but like we've been able to keep writing group going over Zoom. Um, you know, I feel like I've been incredibly influenced by writing group by by the writers that we've been working with for so long. Um, and it's like only gets clearer, like as we all like go on in our careers and write more books and do more stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, like the clearest thing is probably, um, I feel like when we were first starting out when, when we were young, a lot of us, um, maybe especially in like the chapter that's like the New York chapter now, um, but, um, you know, but maybe across, um, like a lot of us were interested in genre and sort of like playing with genre fiction and like subverting genre fiction and like asking like, what has genre fiction left out and what is it included? Mm -hmm. um, and, I think like that's part of what made me feel like it could be okay to like write a speculative novel for my first novel um, mm -hmm. and feel like, you know, I could apply to grad school with that. I could do that in grad school. Um, and also definitely what made me feel like wanting to try a Western, um, you know, that felt like a genre that, um, you know, I hadn't necessarily experimented with. Um, later after this book was done, I kind of like went back and looked at, um, 
like a number of really interesting revisionist westerns that have come over, come out over the last few years. Um, the most prominent is is definitely How Much of These Hills is Gold, which is such a wonderful novel. Um, but there's also and actually Wahini, who I think is here um, and and who is in writing group, turned me on to a couple of these, including In the Distance, um, which is like. I think the Times described it as a weird Western. It's so weird. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever read. It's so good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, I think these communities like have been incredibly important, like obviously for friendship and support and kind of like keeping certainly keeping me writing, keeping us writing. But like I think it's it's been really fascinating to see like how like my development as an artist is totally reliant on those communities. Like mm -hmm. my writing group has totally shaped my development as an artist. And I think like, I'm proud to be able to say that now, like even to call myself an artist, like takes a lot, you know? Um, but to be able to see like, these are my influences, you know, um, that's really, um, I don't know. That makes me feel really good. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, and yeah, I'm so I'm, I'm so grateful for a writing group. And yeah, this past year, man, it's been such a lifeline. Definitely. Um, I I do have other questions, but um, I see so many questions in the in the Q and A box. I feel so I should switch over. Um, maybe I'll just the final question would be: Are there any other um, revisionist Western um, books and or books like The Midwife's Diary um, that you would recommend that people read if people are interested in 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 these kinds of stories? Definitely How Much of These Souls is Gold and In the Distance. Um, I also just recently read Taya Obrett's Inland, which is really interesting and is sort of in the same vein. Um, you know, I was, I've been, um, I've been working on an essay about Westerns and the sort of revisionist Western tradition. Um, and this is not a Western, but I was thinking about the book, The Roundhouse a lot as I've been working on this essay, just because it, um, it looks at, um, it looks at issues of land and sovereignty, um, you know, and um, also looks at it from the perspective of indigenous characters, um, which like a lot of Westerns don't necessarily center. Um, and again, not a Western, but just like the, these, these kinds of land issues like come up a lot in Westerns um, because Westerns can be about the idea of manifest destiny. Um, and the Roundhouse is looking at some of those from a in a different way. Um, so those are just a handful, um, yeah. I also want to show you guys something. So um, I, I did, I, I workshopped my outfit for tonight and you can't really see the coolest thing about it. This is, we're going to bring a lighter mood for a minute. Um, but this is, this dress is from this company called Fashion Brand Company. And this is the cool thing about it. Whoa. <laughs> it's a moth. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I showed it to my kid and he's like, mommy, moth again, more mothing. I love this. Can um, you up again? I can't yes, I definitely can. Nice. Yes, it's this. really yeah. amazing. Um, also, this company makes dresses for lizards. Um, and this dress is also available in lizard. It's affordable. It's like 38 bucks. Some of their clothes for lizards are really expensive. <laughs> Um, but, uh, but you can get this for your lizard for $38. So, um, yeah, just wanted to put that out there. This is incredible. I <laughs> this is a very powerful outfit. Anna. Thank you. Thank you. I tried. It's, 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 it's the book, which is also a very powerful book. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, I will switch to audience questions since I know, um, since there are a lot of these and I want to get through as many as we can. Um, Let's see, maybe a first question comes from um, Kristen Page, um, Madania. Congrats, Anna, I've read your other works and I've noticed that you often build your stories around strong, authentic um, teenage characters. Can you talk a bit about what draws you to that age group? Hi, hi KP, it's great to hear from you. Um, yeah, great question. I was realizing this too. I hadn't like really thought about this that much, but definitely this book and America Pacifica are both about, like they are about teenage, um, teenage protagonists. Um, and in Sophie Stark, they kind of, you know, they start young and they get older. Um, you know, I think, um, I wonder if some of it goes back to some of that sort of genre influence. Um, my first book is a post-apocalyptic novel. Um, and I, that book was really heavily influenced by Neil Stevenson, by Snow Crash, um, and the Diamond Age. And the Diamond Age has this young female protagonist. Um, 
And I think there, I, I got at this a tiny bit um, in an essay recently, but I, there is this tradition of young girls in the post-apocalypse. And it's like maybe a little bit like the final girl in horror movies. Um, and I think I really latched onto that when I was younger and I was excited by this idea of like the young, the young female protagonist who's sort of like, you know, like kicking ass at the end of the world or whatever. Um, and as I've gotten older, like my ideas about that have, have changed a little bit. And I think like, I think of Ada in a really different way than I think of like Darcy from America Pacifica. Um, but I think I'm still interested in, you know, people at a point of identity formation. Um, and for Ada, it's also like this point of career formation, which I think is really important. She like, she is someone who it's hard for women to have careers in this world, but she is setting out to have a career and that's going to be really important. And like her work in the world is going to be really important. And so that's part of it too, I think, part of, part of my focusing on that point when she is like getting started with her work. Great. Um... There is a question from Phoebe Lett, and the question is, if you can speak to your own, how did your own relationship with motherhood um, impact your writing in this book that is so much about child, childbirth or the lack thereof? Hi, Phoebe. Um, yeah, it's really interesting because um, I had finished, like, like I was saying, I'd finished most of this book before he was born, but then I still had like a chunk left. And I was like working on writing about this, that, you know, how did, how did motherhood change, change my writing? And so I was looking back at the stuff that I wrote um, after he was born. And I noticed in particular, there's one part um, where I write about, I'm not gonna give like too much away, but I write about a space where people come for reproductive health care and they come there um, to give birth. They also come to get abortions. They come, um, you know, with like a number of questions that they have in this world that's like really obsessed with reproduction. Um, and the space I realized was like, I designed it in my mind to be like the space that I would wanna go, like if I gave birth again. Um, or a space that like, you know, if I, I don't have a daughter, but if I ever had a daughter, I want her to go like if she ever needs care. Um, and I don't think I would have known how to construct a space like that before I gave birth. Um, that's like the positive. The thing that I worry about now is like, there were so many sections of the book that were super hard to read now that I have a kid. Like there's, you know, people die in childbirth. Um, you know, there's infant mortality in the book. Like it's never like a major focus, but it's definitely there. Those are really hard to read. I can no longer like watch like TV or movies where there's like a child in peril. So I'm a little bit worried, like with my next book, am I gonna like pull my punches and like not be able to write about hard stuff? Like if I become completely soft, I'm definitely con concerned about this as a writer um, and I don't know what to do about it. It, but but maybe talk to other writers who are parents is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I also feel as though I don't know. I feel so with friends with friends who are parents. Like in so, in some ways, like there's so much so much of what what parents learn. Like I feel so it's it's so like punk rock. Um, I guess that's what, <laughs> <laughs> so like maybe you're getting softer in some ways, but I think you're also getting more punk rock. Um, okay, I hope so. <laughs> <y 'all>, like, <laughs> I think I'm stealing that from Jenny Offal's book, um, the first one, but or, no, the second one. Anyway. <laughs> Um, somebody, um, let's see, Tiffany Brown says something that, that's very true. Um, yes, um, Tiffany Brown says, please suggest purchase of this book to your li libraries in order to make it accessible to audiences of multiple economic backgrounds. Yes, 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 totally. yes. Buying books is great. Checking out books from your library is great. Um, a really great, great way to support books is to actually ask your library to get it. Um, and then most likely your library will. And libraries are wonderful and we love them very much. Yes, um, totally. Uh, let's see, there's a question from Maura Finkelstein. I loved the book and inhaled it in a day. One of the many things I loved was how the horses, especially Amity, were their own characters. How did you learn to write about horses? Were you previously a horse person, <laughs> have horse knowledge, and or did you research study in order to write them? Um, this is a great question. I love it. First of all, definitely co-sign everything about libraries. Um, I really miss libraries during this time. I'm really excited for when I'm able to take my son to them again. Um, absolutely support support your libraries and they're a wonderful resource um, for so many communities. Um, but yeah, for horses. Um, so I was never really a horse person, but um, my best friend from high school um, is, is actually now is a horse trainer. Um, and knows a lot about horses um, and has always known a lot about horses. So, um, you know, I always like, I have, I have this influence on me um, of, of horse knowledge. Um, and I wanted to ride with her um, while I was researching the book. But then um, when I was kind of at that stage in my research, I was also pregnant and then I was kind of scared. I was like, is it safe to ride a horse while you're pregnant? I think people do. 
Um, but you know, I just like, she lives in California and then it like kind of didn't come up. Um, but so I did a ton of online research. Um, I do think I talked to her a little bit, um, and, you know, kind of had just like learned some of it by osmosis. Um, but I was really worried about those parts cause I'm not like actually a horse person. And I know that like people, like people know a lot about horses and I was like, I, I was nervous. Um, but I do hope it came through that I like really care about them as characters. And like, I, I thought like a lot about their names. I thought a lot about their appearance. Like I wanted, um, you know, I feel like there were a lot of things about Westerns that I wanted to subvert but actually Westerns are like do really make horses really central um like even like traditional westerns so i kind of wanted to preserve that the idea that the horse is like this really important thing um let's see maybe that's a maybe we'll segue into guillermo perez's book um and book his his question or their question um guillermo's question is how do you brainstorm and brew your ideas for a book um is your research for this book more structured um when you went into writing it or do you prefer a more relaxed approach so I definitely did more research for this book than for any of my other books, um, mostly about the history, because even though um, it's an alternate history, I wanted to know about the real history before I messed with it. Um, and especially, um, you know, I wanted to like have a full picture of the history of what, you know, Americans sometimes call the American West, because um, I don't know that I got a full picture of it in school or that a lot of people in America do. Um, so for this book, I did a lot. I did a lot of reading of books. I did, I went to some museums, um, you know, and then a ton of just Googling. Um, and I also visited Wyoming. I went, um, I went to Wyoming where the real hole in the wall is. Um, and we drove out there. Um, I spent some time just like taking a ton of photographs. Um, we also went to, um, in the Rockies in Colorado where a little part of the book is set also. Um, and that was really helpful. Um, but in terms of like brainstorming ideas, I feel like for me that usually doesn't start with research. It usually just starts with like making a bunch of mistakes for like an average of one year to longer. Um, definitely with this book, it took at least that long before I even knew that I wanted it to be a Western. Um, with Sophie Stark, it probably took a year before I realized it wanted to be multiple points of view. Um, yeah, I just like kind of sit there with my notebook and like make like a lot of like bad paragraphs. And then like over time, then I'll like have something that I don't hate and then I go from there. Um, I'm envious of your one year of mistakes. I feel like so, <laughs> so far with, with my two novels, so far it's been more like three uh, years of mistakes <laughs> before something finally kicks in. <laughs> I mean, who knows, um, so talk to me after the next one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, a relevant question it comes from to that, um, relevant to that, it comes from Shelby Hartness and it says, how do you per persevere against doubt? What brings you back to the page? Oh man, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think like w one way to answer that, um, I used, when I was in high school, I used to play the French horn. Um, and I was really bad at it. Like I'm very bad at music. Um, and I was a terrible French, the French horn's a very difficult instrument and I was very bad at it. Um, and I remember that one thing that they told us um, in music class was like, you have to start getting just an internal sense of like when you're in tune, when you're sounding good and when you're not sounding good, when you're not in tune. Um, and I, I never came anywhere close. I like could not develop that internal sense. And I, um, I ended up like not playing French horn anymore because I just was so bad at it. But I do think I kind of took that lesson and with fiction tried to develop an internal sense of when something's working and when it's not working. Um, and so when I feel like something's not working, um, you know, then I have a variety of like not very helpful techniques like going for a walk or you know taking a break or um a lot of times it's just it's like you know because i've been writing these books while doing journalism so it's like okay well now i have to go to work we can look at this tomorrow we can look at this over the weekend um you know just like taking time away um but i do sort of feel like over time i've been able to develop a sense where like once something is working then i can kind of feel it so I usually like know that like eventually I'll get there and I'll feel it when I get there. And so if, if I just kind of keep doing it, then eventually it'll happen. Um, so unlike with the French horn where it never happens, which is probably good for everyone. 
Michael, my husband, um, played the French horn in high school. Yeah, he's he has these like cool stories about how incredibly hard it was. Um, it's really hard. It's one of the hardest brass instruments. And I also played the trumpet, and I was like bad at that, but like not quite as bad because it's easier. Um, well, maybe on that note, we can end with a question from Mar Maddie Gartenstein. Um, what do you do for fun? Um, I'm like trying to think. These days it's tough. <laughs> um, no, I know, no, no, I that's... like, I want to hear about fun. Like, I know, what is fun? Um, <laughs> no, okay. So, I mean, like reading fiction is one thing. Like I'm trying to get back into reading fiction for pleasure. I'm really excited about the books that have come out already this year. I'm really excited about The Prophets. I'm really excited about Detransition Baby. Um, Ixta Murray's book that's coming out later this year. I'm like really excited to read. Um, there, you know, so so reading is like one thing and trying to make that be fun and not work. Um, and like, actually I like coloring. I started making myself do that. Like while I watch TV to make myself not read the news. Um, and I wanted something that's like not productive. That's like, there's no like hustle. Like you can't like sell your coloring or do anything with it. No one wants it. Um, and I actually feel like that's, that's really calming. Um, and you can also purchase coloring books from a lot of independent bookstores, just FYI.